Hello and welcome back to another episode of Tash Teaches. I'm Tash and in today's video I wanted to share with you 10 more of my favorite Bitwig 4.3 tips and tricks. So without further ado, let's jump right in and I'm going to show you exactly what I'm talking about. Tip number one deals with very easily and quickly being able to access any modulation amounts on any parameter in Bitwig. We can see here I've got this bass line and we've got a little bit of pulse width modulation happening here. And it's happening from one of these modulators. Now, obviously there are very few here. We can guess that that's probably coming from this LFO. But say we had 20 or 30 modulators, and I can see this wiggling here, and I know that I've modulated it with something, maybe even some things, and I want to be able to dial back the amount without having to say, find the modulator. So all we have to do is take the parameter in question, right click, and you can see down here that LFO3 is now modulating this pulse width by that amount. We can now increase that. And what's cool as well is say I had another modulator like this, uh, this smooth moving random here. I could map that to it as well. And now I can see that we've got some rather wild modulation happening here. So if I want to dial back that random amount, right click, click on random. Tip number two deals with very quickly being able to apply a certain edit to a parameter of something in a drum rack or an instrument layer to everything in that layer. Looking here, I've got a drum rack full of some rather horrendous open hats. Which in the context of the song uh, are far too washy. Now what I want to do is I want to make all of those hats nice and tight, nice and short. So if I were to have a look at say this sound, I could bring the sustain down. And then if I bring the decay down, I can get a nice tight, tight little hit there. But if I want to change that on every one without having to go in and manually do it, on any changed parameter, you can right click and do copy value to all layers. And you can see that now every layer has its sustain down. All I have to do again is change the decay, copy value to all layers. And now every hat in here is nice and small. I could change the pitch change anything. I could change the volume. Very handy. Tip number three is really handy if, like me, you like to produce music on the fly, i.e. on the sofa or in the garden. And a lot of the time I don't have a MIDI controller, so I'm using the laptop keyboard as my MIDI keyboard. Now, most of the time, as soon as you start playing any instrument in Bitwig using the MIDI keyboard that is your keyboard, you're going to be getting very hard, harsh notes. And this can be quite painful when you're writing music because you load up some sort of beautiful sound, then you bash it out on the keyboard, and it just sounds like a child smashing a piano. So in order to dial down the velocity of what we're playing on the keyboard, there are two letters on here that will help us do that. C will allow us to go down in velocity until you're really playing next to silent. And V, in contrast, will allow us to increase our velocity. So you can dial down C a few times and get a lovely soft sound. And if you want something a little harder, press V all the way to the top and you can get something that crunches the speakers. If you have two pairs of monitor speakers and you use Bitwig and they're not set up like this, tip number four is gonna be rather handy. Now I've got two pairs of monitor speakers. You can see that I've got my Pioneer uh, big speakers here and then I've got my smaller iLoud micro monitors. On the back of my sound card, you can see that I have the main speakers plugged into output one and two. And then in this output three and four, I've got the two iLoud speakers. If we head back over to Bitwig, under the options for outputs, we can add mono, stereo, add speakers and add headphones. I'm gonna add another pair of speakers. Now because my sound card, the 18i20, has a variety of outputs, you can see them all listed here. But three and four is where my second pair of speakers are. So I could call this iLoud. And on that point, all I now have to do if I were playing through the song, is I can go down here to the in and out panel, the, the inputs and outputs, and you can see that I now have two options for speakers. So if I were to be playing through on something like this, I can now very quickly change to my other speakers. After close to a decade of procrastination, I've finally pulled my thumb out of my ass and put out my first ever sample pack in collaboration with my label Glitter Cowboy. 
A large amount of the samples in here were manipulations of sounds that I fell in love with and then recorded on my many world travels, all captured on my favourite microphone of course, the sweet sweet iPhone. You can grab my pack over on my Bandcamp for $12, but if you're a member of my Patreon page, check the site to grab your 20% discount code. I put a lot of love into crafting a pack that I would be happy to download myself, so I hope you can feel it and make some real magic. Back to the video. If you ever tried to modulate or automate some sort of parameter on an external VST or effect, and you found that there doesn't seem to be any interface between Bitwig and the plugin, tip number five is going to be very helpful for this. I have an instrument here on Omnisphere, and Omnisphere is a fantastic plugin with all sorts of incredible presets and a huge amount of sound shaping possibilities. But if I wanted to say over time, play with this cutoff or this resonance, and I'd maybe like to add an, an LFO to that inside Bitwig, or maybe I'd like to automate it over some time. When I touch this knob, it doesn't seem to provide any sort of interface down here for me to modulate it. And I can't see here any plugin uh, parameters other than just these things called parameter. So like with a few other plugins, there's a, an extra step you need to take, which is let's say we want to play with this cutoff. You're going to right click on that and enable host automation. Now this is the same in a lot of contact plugins as well, but now that I've done that, if I click on it again, you can see that I now have access to that filter cutoff, which of course means that I now also have access to using Bitwig and it's plenty of toys. And this works with as many parameters as you want. If you then click on another one, we could uh, do a, say, uh, um, something fucking with the resonance. And again, if you ever can't find that parameter that you want to automate or modulate, try right clicking it and see if you can enable host automation first. Tip number six is really handy if you're trying to mix two objects that you really want to sit with each other, say a kick and a bass. I've got soloed here the bass line and the kick of the track. And say I wanted to create a little bit more space in that low end of the bass, not that I necessarily need to, but say I want to create a little bit of space where maybe the kick is taking up a bit more of the room. I've got the EQ8, oh sorry, the EQ plus here on the bass channel. If I click on it and go over to the inspector panel, at the bottom I have the option to pick a reference. So I'm gonna pick kick. And when I play now, you can see that we've got the purple outline of that kick. If I were to say change the frequency of that kick, like roll off some of the, the low part, you can see here that that's being reflected as well. Now this is really, really handy when you've got an element that just doesn't seem to be fitting with the rest. You can just pop on an EQ and remove a little bit here, add a little bit there, and you can then be making decisions truly based off of the frequencies of the other channel rather than just whatever the hell you think it needs. Sometimes it can be really handy to see a real-time visual feedback of the shape of your sounds. Uh, this can be particularly handy with kicks and claps when you're trying to make sure that the flam and sort of the body are the perfect length for each other. I've got soloed here the kick and the clap. What I want to be able to do is see a visual representation of the, the summing of the kick and the clap as lengths because I have a, a suspicion that if I altered the, the shape of the clap a little bit, it would sit a little bit better in the mix. So on the kick, I've loaded up an oscilloscope here. And if I just press play as it is, we don't really get much. I can't really see much here. So I'm going to change the, the scaling. I'm going to bring this down. Uh, in fact, no, I'm going to turn on the key follow and I'm just going to be able to bring this down a little bit and that's going to increase the amount of, uh, of audio that we're actually seeing. We can also change the device view to wide. So now I have a slightly wider view of it and I can increase the gain if I want to see it bigger on the spectrum. But like with the EQ, we also have the option to pick a B channel or a reference. And under the reference, I'm going to pick my clap. So let's go to the snare group here. And you can now see that we have that visual representation of it. And that can be a really handy way of visualizing, if we zoom in even more, of visualizing the placement of those pieces. So I can see that actually I do like the positioning of that clap. If I were to move the clap a little bit, in fact, let's swap this over here so I can actually be working on the clap channel itself. So let's do kick will be our other layer. And let's slow this down a little bit and 
Very nice. So now if I were to take a time shift, I can move that clap and get visual representation of it. So I've gone forward 6, 10 milliseconds, and you can see that that's now shifted it almost into time. And I can pull it back. I'm even liking it a little bit before the beat. And uh, we could swap this and now say try with uh, the, the hat and the clap. So let's take the hat group. Very handy. I can also increase the gain, of course, if I want to see the, those hats louder without having to hear them louder. Tip number eight is a rather small and silly thing, but it's something that I appreciate anyway in Bitwig. And it's to do with fades. I've got here something I'd probably never have in a track, which is just a bunch of open hi-hats on the one. And uh, no prizes to be won there. But I thought this was a nice, simple way of demonstrating how handy it is that you can do sort of additional fading. So let's say I wanted to make all of these hi-hats nice and short. Well, I could highlight all of the hats on there, and I could shorten them, and I could fade them in like this. And if I zoom in like that, I could get even bigger of a fade. I could tighten that up like that. But what's really nice is now that I have faded that, if I were to take all of this and consolidate it, it's consolidated it keeping those fades. And those fades still exist within the clip. And what's really cool is I can now add a fade over the top of those fades. And that has left the pieces inside faded as they were. And I can still edit them independently of that master fade. And this is just really handy when you're doing, say, um, big edits of top loop clips. Because you can do subtle enveloping inside, but then overall get a smooth volume fade as you, say, go into a breakdown or smooth volume fade in at the intro. Tip number nine is something I talked about in a video a couple of years ago, and it's additive automation. I've got a very simple little MIDI clip in here. And it would be cool to have some sort of movement, you know, some, some sort of thing happening over the course of this. And of course, what would be quite cool is, say, to have, let's bring the skew up. Let's have some sort of thing automating that filter open. So if I were to down here draw in an automation line that over the space of these four bars opens that filter. It's uh, interesting, of course, but where the automation power of Bitwig really steps it up a notch is the ability to then go in here. And if I click and press A, I can go to my automation view. And you can see that I've drawn in here that automation line. The actual clip itself is only one bar, and that's indicated here by the dividing lines and the fact that this doesn't continue. What we've got here is something which is unlinked automation. If I were to consolidate this, you can now see that we have the whole length. But what I want to do is I want to create some sort of modulation thing that happens only over the length of one bar that then is added to what else I do on top. So if I go in here, I can now turn my pen on, and I'm just going to do some squiggly lines. And let's just see what this looks like. Oh, sorry. We've actually got this line. First of all, I'm going to go over here to the automation type, and I'm going to click the plus, which is the additive automation. And this will allow me to draw in some sort of silly thing. And that will then be added to or subtracted from the main automation. And you can see it's, it's referenced down here with this sort of blue line that's showing that it's, uh, it's changing shape. If I do something a little curvier... You can see that that's now the automation following the overall line of this. So if I were to curve that, I'm curving that automation plus this. There's also the option for the multiplication aisle uh, lane. So if I do some sort of thing like that, you can see then that within the space of the bar, we're increasing the multiplication that that thing is happening. So if we listen to that in context now. This is really handy when you're trying to create automation that builds over the pace of a track, but doesn't just feel like a fader rising. Our final tip today is really handy if, like me, you enjoy creating drum beats out of audio files in the arranger view. I've got here uh, a kick, a clap, and some hats. And these hats, especially here and around here, we have some notes in the 16 note range. And what I mean by that is it's the second and the fourth 16 note, like this bit in particular, if we just solo this. 
That is a space in notes where if I were to apply swing to the track, this one would move forward a little bit, and then this one would move forward a little bit. And although Bitwig isn't quite as good as Ableton with its groove pools, the swing function up here is rather good. But I am presented with a bit of a predicament here because I've worked in audio. If I listen to this now and I turn on the groove, nothing has changed. And that's because groove doesn't affect individual audio files on the arranger view. Groove will affect individual little pieces of audio within a clip, or should we say events within a clip will be grooved, but just clips on a timeline will not be grooved. So the way that we can get around this by still working on the timeline is if we take all of our pieces of audio that have been separated and added into their own little space, and we consolidate them into a clip, this clip now still has those three independent events, but it now means that we can turn on swing. because now Swing registers that there are these individual notes. Well, folks, that's sadly all we have time for today, but I do hope that this video was useful. If you enjoyed it, then please remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and smash that notifications bell too, but only if you'd like to keep up to date with all of my future videos. In the meantime, happy Saturday, and happy creating.